I played that bit from Wally because that's sort of that piece I think is probably the one that people would know. But there's a piece that I absolutely love because I love that it's so weird and it's just so deliciously bizarre. And it's one of those that if you didn't know Thomas Newman's work intimately, you would not guess this is him. Um, but when I listen to it, I'm like, this is so Thomas Newman. I, I wanted to show you this because I don't know the last time you heard this. Oh, come on. Right? Even, yeah, oh yeah. Just that sound. Very so, Pavlovian response to that. Yeah, my buddy... Uh, Eric Castro at the hungry bartender I think this is whatever he rebuilds these and so he like built me an OG Game Boy and then sent me a card with uh, all the games in there and last night I came a hair's breadth away from finally beating a game I'll hopefully do it tonight um, from from a, a beating a game that I started uh, the last time I played it was like 13. Which? I gotta know. Super Mario Land. Wow. You came yeah, a hair's breadth? Final boss. How long does that take? I always loved how long. games like that, you know, it's, it's in reality they're like 20 minutes long. Yeah, it's like 12 levels. So it's like, you know, world one, three phases, two, three phases, three, three phases, and four, three phases. And right. I got I I beat the first you know the mini boss and then it was like oh no 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 now there's another boss it was so cool because it's like everything up to that point I never gotten made it to the last world and so I made it to the last world and I was like man I was like really proud I was like you're gonna do it man you're gonna do it for that that 13 year old nope fuck you you're going to bed <laughs> so, <laughs> Pam literally gave up she said I'm going to bed I was like I'm so close which normally <laughs> is, has a different connotation. Yeah, well, similar. But, but I was just gonna say, yeah, similar. Not not as different as it might seem. Right. That's too funny. That was my basically my favorite part of saying stuff like that is knowing that Dallas has to edit this and making him feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Hi, Dallas. <laughs> uh, just for that, this is staying in. Hell um, yeah, it is. That's too funny. Hey, I, that what, kid's a talent. That kid's a talented filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. Props to Dallas on his short film featuring one Troy Baker. Yeah, check it out. Resident on uh, on the YouTube's. Yeah, th yeah. I was I was really happy that uh, that you did that, and I was really happy to see him take that up. That whole thing began because on this uh, there's a Facebook group that my agent loves to kind of give advice in and talk to people and sort of throw out little philosophical questions about our careers and ambition and the artistry versus the business and all that kind of thing. And he's always dropping little posts of, you know, what do you think about X, Y, Z, you know, and, and uh, it's just become kind of his little pastime. And um, the discussion at some point emerged of how much composers ben would benefit if they truly understood filmmaking. And so he goes, mm. okay, here's the challenge. You have till September 1st or whatever it was, um, to make a short film, and the and you know he he laid a few ground rules, but one of the one of the ground rules was as like to the composers I am addressing, you are not allowed to score your own film, you must direct, um, and uh, and he himself uh, stepped up to the plate to make like my agent Richard, he stepped up to to make his own film as well just to participate it he ended up getting bypass surgery uh, uh, in the middle and he's uh, he's he's doing great come out the other end but he's like my film is slightly delayed but I promise I, I did almost finish it uh, but Dallas wow. Dallas's entry was that uh, film he took he took him up on it really and, and, and yeah that was, was say, he went he went full Coppola on that he's like hey I might die making apocalypse now <laughs> <laughs> yeah and yeah, it won't no, even it was, be my best movie it was uh it was a really cool um, it was a really cool thing that he put together and I, I having having done little taste of that sort of thing in the past I can definitely say nothing teaches you more about scoring film than making a film uh, you know it's yeah it, man the empathy for your collaborators is so valuable that is the word right there that and that that goes so, to one of my my favorite lessons hmm. um, Taught to me by Steve Zahn. 
Um, you love your Steve Zahn stories. He's, he's seemed like seemed like that guy really did a number on you. I learned about rye whiskey from Steve Zahn. He's a good dude. He's a solid dude. He's a great actor. Um, yeah, I get that feeling. But the the fact that he said never be the one they're waiting on. Yeah, I was like, that's some of the best acting advice I've ever I've ever given, I've ever been given, and you know, consequently, subsequently, paid have. it forward. Yeah, paid it forward. Speaking of paying it forward, Austin Bartholomew. <laughs> Most people don't know that's his middle name. Wintery, whose birthday has just passed, cresting you into the year 37 of our Lord. What do that you would have? That would entail I am the Lord, yes? I mean, If I it's the 37th be. year of our Lord? It's the 37th year of you, our Lord. I mean, hey. in, the, in, the, in the world of, <laughs> you know, if we embrace a solipsistic worldview... I can't yeah. actually prove that anything other than myself exists. I suppose I can't I'm, prove that I'm not God. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't prove that all of this isn't my own imagination. It's possible that my subconscious kind of at the moment of birth wrote all prior music, all the Beatles songs, all the Beethoven, you know, symphonies. Everything was born into consciousness at the moment of my birth because it's all in my it's all in my head. The entire you had universe. me up into the Beatles. What do you have on the docket for us today? I first off, did you get the little link? Are you yeah, are straight. you streaming? Look at it, two twenty one, and this time I'm recording. Which, if you watched the last play, watch, listen. I did not. <laughs> I did not. Did you? I wonder if there's any. I haven't even watched it yet. I we had such a great I, conversation. I, I forgot to record. <laughs> I clicked the, the link and I had forgotten. I I, I I scrubbed it to to. I was actually I pulled it up. Someone tagged me on Twitter saying, like, dude, your weird floating head thing was so disturbing. And I showed oh, Anhila, I pulled up the video to say, hey, look, look at my funny Zoom silliness. And um, I scrubbed through it, and you always sounded fine. I think we did okay. Um, I want to play this for you and see if, one, you know it, and okay. two, if you don't know it. I heard strings. Yeah, well, there's that narrows the list. There's only ten thousand people it could Not possibly be. Not much gets be past now. this guy. <laughs> um, right. I'm gonna just hit play, and you tell me if you know who the composer is. Howard Shore. No. <laughs> Have I got it? Those are some lush strings. Ugh. I'm going to automatically say it's for a period piece. Uh, that is, that is correct. Is, I mean, but like, like old, so like maybe even something that, that's going like ancient times no, or it, something that is set. Harmonic writing, isn't Dude, it? Dude, yeah, just the relationship between the horn, the brass, and the and the strings is just they're supporting and working against each other at the same time. Are those French horns? Mm -hmm. Getting better. Your boy's learning. <laughs> I love French horns. Ugh. 
So. I have no idea. That was Can't what wait. I was hoping would be the case. Now I'm going to play another thing. <sighs> Don't tell me anything. Just, just. Yeah, yeah, just just same composer. You know, this is this is we're back to the all it's all one composer day. Um so this is the same this is the same keep it same seats. Neither of us has the right drink for this music. Just four bar blues. Sounds like the theme song like Turner and Hooch or something. What is that? <laughs> so, um, if you just had to take a completely wild stab at who our composer is. Philip Glass. <laughs> That is truly a wild stab. No. Although imagine <laughs> imagine if he's like, yeah, I occasionally do some some sort of sort of blues rock uh, on the side for fun. No, not Philip Glass. So here's the here's my hint for you. This is a composer you're actually really familiar with. Um, and my goal today is to show sides of this composer that despite your familiarity, you don't you didn't Did know you these do pieces. Goddamn Randy Newman. Ha! <laughs> no. Mm, no. Okay. The day will come though. You will be given <laughs> your Randy Newman comeuppance, but not today. Here is the thing today is gonna be about me. Um <laughs> that is oh, okay, it's not James Newton Howard, it's not Thomas Newman, it's not Howard Shore, it's not Ennio Morricone. Um, I feel like, you know, this is what I love about this is that I feel like as a musician, I'm like, yeah, man, I don't know. I know composers. I know I pay attention to scores. And what I, what I realize is that the arrogance of that statement, because I really, really don't, it's like saying, I know who Monet is and I know who Picasso is. So I know a lot about art. It's like, no, you know, two artists <laughs> and you probably don't know all their work. You probably don't know much of their history. But it's it's so, like all things. The more you know, the more you realize there is to learn. That's one of those things I absolutely yeah. love about you can go deep down, especially if it's a prolific composer. And this is true of every, you know, songwriter, producer, classical composer, film composer, throughout wherever people have worked. If they produced a sufficiently large body of work, then there will it will naturally sort into they're the things that are the most famous. And then here mm. are the things that, you know, you've probably heard. And then there's probably this base to the pyramid of treasure trove of stuff that, for whatever reason, is not the most popular. And there could be real gems in there. That I, you got to dig. I for. would love to find like the J.D. Salinger of, you know, of, of composers. Like, who is the guy that did the one? And that's it. There are a few of those. There are a few. There are a few who are that way because of circumstances in life, like Christopher Comeda, who did Rosemary's Baby and then died. Um, that would be Confederacy of Dunces. That, that uh, would be more a, a better analog for that then. Well, true. I guess I guess the, the J.D. Salinger, the, the like, who wrote one. I mean, Aaron Copeland wrote only a couple of scores, but he lived well. I mean, he died in 1990. You know, he lived well. He could How have been scoring. How old was he? It was like 90s? Yeah, he, he has the easiest memory. He, he was born 1900, died 1990. He has the easiest years to remember ever. And um, so he could well, have been person, scoring films forever, you know, for the person for, who was born 1900 and 1901. That to me would be easier. <laughs> Less math. It's like. How Fair enough. One. Fair <laughs> enough. Yes. True. True. Zero. <laughs> less less <laughs> likely to have uh, made an impact in the world of art, but true. Dark, yes, I'll give you dark, that. Dark. Dark. Okay. So, who I give? Who's our? Who's our? Who's Here, our I'll docket today. So this is the this is what I love is that I'm sure there's some contention to folks who are watching who who know it screaming and, at me. I know who you are. Well, here's I the know best who part. You are. The best part is. Looking There's two delicious things that teed this up unwittingly. First off, chocolate. You said their name. You went, I know it's not. You rattled off some names, and it was <gasps> one of those people. No, 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 no. Hold on. 
Wait a minute. Okay, so I said James Newton Howard. We've already done James Newton Howard. Uh, kind of. James I Newton mean, we, we did a romantic comedy which heavily featured him, but I haven't actually done a fully dedicated James Newton Howard. But it's not James Newton Howard. It is not James Newton Howard. Thomas Newman. It is Thomas it, Newman. Huh? It is Thomas Newman. Ah. Oh, man. And here, here's the best part, because at the beginning you went, it almost, I almost thought maybe you had read my mind or I accidentally had something on screen because you said, so speaking of pay it forward, because that's a movie he scored. Um, and so I thought, do you know where wow. we're going with this? <laughs> wow. Yeah, Thomas Newman, I, I, I know him from more of like the, the 90s, schmaltzy sentimental feel good stuff right well the, the, the brilliance of his career is that he is known for a handful of things like the back to back in quotes like only in, in close proximity to each other uh, Shawshank Redemption and American Beauty absolutely assured his place as the top of the especially the kind of so called artsy you mm. know Oscar Beatty, he's gotten 15 Oscar nominations and never won. Wow. He's, 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 I Wait, think. Wait, he's only won one? He's never won. <gasps> no way. I think he's the most nominated. Uh, yeah, I forgot he did Wally. I'm looking I, him up right now. Well, yeah, that was the next thing I was going to say is that he's also done, you know, Pixar films. You know, he did a few Pixar films. He's done several Bond films now. Like, there are people that know him for different things, but he, his original contribution for sure. Uh, that really solidified his place on the map was uh, American Beauty and Shawshank. Um, the first, yeah, like Grumpy Old Men phenomenon. That's what that that's one of my. That's the a John great Travolta one. movie. Yeah, it's not a great movie. Uh, Meet Joe Black. That's what I. Rem that's one of the ones that I remembered. And they um, all have that same, for lack of a better way to put it, Thomas Newman quality, where it's. It's very kind of atmospheric. It's very, um, uh, uh, you know, improvisational sounding. And and they he he literally would do that. He and a few musicians like George Daring on guitar. Um, I can't remember who would be on percussion, but they would literally sit around with the footage of the movie and they'd like jam together and and improvise music. And then he'd go back and add orchestra and stuff to it. Um, and so a lot of that, you know, kind of you know. Like, I think a lot of that stuff was a bit, I don't know if that exact one is literally improvised on a stage, but a lot of his music that has that quality is because it quite, it quite literally is them saying, ooh, ooh, let's try that. But George, try it on the 12 string. I'm going to- That kind of sounds like Dave Brubeck though, like that right there, that, that super jazzy kind of- What, what I just like played? What you just, well, I mean, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not saying like that sounds like, you know, take five or whatever, but it, it's, it's that notion of, all right, I'm just going to kind of- oscillate chords back and forth and and you see what what is the top line to this and that's how a lot go, of how they work i as my understanding from talking to uh, some of those musicians and then go now let's make those wins yeah kind of wow and so wow. it's it's pretty amazing and and so that first score that i played is for the steven soderbergh movie movie from 2006 called the good german uh with george clooney and yeah. it it got a lot of attention because it sounded like Thomas Newman being hired to essentially sound like his father, Alfred Newman, who was one of the, you know, original founders of Hollywood film scoring, won nine Oscars, 50 nominations, 45 nominations, uh, head of the music department, 20th Century Fox, and basically launched the careers of John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, et cetera, et cetera. That's Thomas Newman's dad. But there is no connection between Thomas Newman and Randy Newman, correct? They're, they're cousins. No, they they're are. Cousins. No, they, their fathers were brothers. That's how the, the Newmans... Work. The Newmans uh, are Could like this massive dynasty because there were a handful of brothers all active in Hollywood. Was the guy Hollywood. that started the Cracked Magazine or Mad Magazine. <laughs> yeah, D the Alfred E. Newman, always mm. a different... Uh, but yeah, Lionel Newman, Alfred's brother, was also the head of music at Fox and uh, and uh, would you know work with composers all the way through. Like Lionel Newman actually conducted Jerry Goldsmith's score to Alien. Uh, and and uh, and the Omen, which Jerry won an Oscar for. So the Newmans were integrated into Hollywood um, uh, for the entirety of Hollywood. Because then uh, Randy Newman was the son. I'm blanking on who his father was. I always thought it was Emil, but I don't think it is. But his father was like was like a physician to the stars. They were all just Hollywood royalty. 
And Randy Newman obviously started off doing his own thing, wildly different from from you know these classical musician parents. Even though he had that same training, he became a songwriter and producer before really getting established in film music, and eventually, you know, has won Oscars there. Um, and then David and Thomas Newman were the two brothers of the sons of of uh, Alfred, and uh, both started you know in the machine like D Thomas Newman. Um, orchestrated for John Williams um, uh, uh, here and there. Like, he he's credited as an orchestrator. For my on... benefit and also some people in the audience. What does that mean? So orchestration in the context of how John Williams works, because every composer is a little different, is Williams will write out the score. Like, I can show you. Uh, I can kind of make up an example, but the John Williams would be writing on, like, a sketch pad. Just like this, you know, six lines, just sort of blank, um, simple little thing like this. So Williams right. goes, uh, you know, uh, you know, here's my. Uh, this is gonna blow my mind. Here's my, you know, melody, and we've got a bass line uh, that's down here, and then a counter melody that's gonna go like this. Maybe we'll say like that. Do so, you know what you just wrote, or did you just randomize? Like, yeah, it's kind of vaguely inspired by Star Wars. Uh, it's not exactly like you, But that, you know but, in your head what that sounds like. Yeah, it was kind of intentionally a little bit similar to the, like... But it's 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 not that. Um, it's But the point is, like, Williams would write, you know, uh, violin plus flute, this is bassoon, and this is uh, celli plus, you know, bass whatever so like if you look at john williams scores you know it's a lot neater than this his handwriting is like fucking typeface but that might be how he uh writes it out so the orchestrator's job is to look at that and convert that into a properly formatted conductor score and every so now there and again is one just for violins there is one just for that's bass, the copyist just... that's actually that's the next step the, this would be right. for the thing to have for the conductor to have on the podium that lays out all the instruments on their own lines and that allows for more detail and, and things like, you know, if I want if I want the flute's forte and sustained, but I want the clarinet's piano crescendoing to forte, but they're playing the same notes, you might run out of space to, de to kind of differentiate all those little details on a little sketch like this. So the orchestrator might, you know, put those details in and then someone like Williams can basically say whether they agree or not. In the case of someone like him, who's so meticulous and so classical, um, uh, he's not leaving a lot to the imagination of the orchestrators. In other words, the piece is finished. But some people, they don't quite have a comfort level with writing for orchestra. So the orchestrator's job is to really translate their ideas to figure out how they're going to go. You know, they might just be playing chords or, or something, and the orchestrator is the one who's figuring it out how to make it how to make it work. So I'm 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 being very cautious to not veer too often this tangent, but I love learning stuff like this. So an orchestrator depended upon not only who the orchestrator is, but more who the composer is. The, the, the position of the orchestrator could be either more technical or it could be more creative. Yep. Yeah, it's and always going to there... be a blend of the two, but it's going to swear on the spectrum between like clinical and utterly devoid of creativity versus like borderline co-composer. If you think of those as sort of forming a spectrum, they're all going to kind of fit somewhere with Williams being a lot closer to the technical side. So then in Thomas Newman's case, what do you, was, was the person, I'm sorry, you, you mentioned his name and I've already forgotten. Um, the Who? guy that you said he would jam with. Oh, well he has a few musicians, but George Daring is a guitarist. Uh, so George Daring, would you say that he would, but there's no way he was just a musician. He was just a, or like a musician he would come in and collaborate with. That's not, would he ever vibe with his, orchestrator in that sense to be like you're going to be doing this so I want you to be in the room no I think it, I, I suspect that the way he I don't actually know in fact I'm not even sure who his orchestrator uh, is and is there a relationship typically where it's like this is my guy oh yeah yeah Jerry Goldsmith for example worked with like Alexander Courage for like 50 years or uh, 40 okay. years or something you know Alexander Courage most famous for, for writing ah, my hand slipped Ah, Superman. He was the original. <laughs> Brutal. 
The original TV Star Trek uh, composer, Alexander Courage, uh, didn't really do much composing after that and was primarily Jerry Goldsmith's orchestrator. Actually went Wait, to his... but he didn't. Alexander Courage didn't write that. He did rewrote that for the TV show in the 60s. Like, it went, started, bum, ba 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 and then, boy, oh, na, 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 na. That's, that's Sandy Courage. I did not know that. I mm-hmm. thought... Then what did you, what did Gene Roddenberry write? Uh, Gene Bar- Roddenberry wrote the lyrics in order to get on the royalties, which is ah. Uh, actually, you know what? I think actually now that I say that out loud, I'll have to ask. I have a friend who wrote a book called The Music of Star Trek. That's like a thousand pages of everything there is to know ever about Star Trek. I will go and consult the proper expert. But I think maybe what it was is that he wrote actual lyrics that then they did not use. But that way he could still say, I wrote the lyrics to this song. It's just that this version that's on TV, because then he basically gets a little extra paycheck for being part of the music cue sheet. Ironically, uh, ironic coming from the man who is like, we, we don't have any currency in Star our Star Trek. So I just want to understand the lineage of that. So right. Sandy Courage, Alexander Courage wrote the theme, and then Jerry Goldsmith wrote the one for Star Trek The Motion Picture, which became the new television theme. Correct. And for, ne- for Next Generation specifically. Next Generation, yeah. Yeah, but he used it in all of his film scores. You know, of, of like Jerry scored five Star Trek films, and he used his da 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 da. He used that in every one of them. He to him it was the Star Trek theme. Yeah, I mean it's just so good. Just it's perfect. Yeah, and so, but he always, you know, he and he and Alexander Courage had a very close relationship, and he always incorporated that melody. You know, he he to him that was just as much Star Trek as anything. That he could have done. Um, so, um, so yes, uh, Thomas Newman uh, did, you know, did some orchestration work on the side for John Williams and was scoring small movies. Uh, this score that I started with is, you know, well into his career, The Good German, in which he is going for full like 1940s melodramatic. It, it, it's it is a period super to- lush, sweeping. What's funny is it's I, like the, Wagnerian, the, you know. It's it's meant it's meant to sound like when you said period piece, you, you are correct. But it's it is like the music that you would have heard in Nazi Germany, essentially. What's What's interesting is is the they know it was keying in. I was like, man, it almost sounds like Egyptian or um, not messianic, but uh, but there's a there's a uh, like a, a Jewish heritage to it which would have been accurate to kind of playing into those. I don't know what the mode is, but there's a specific mode. Uh, that kind of thing where it's like, I actually that think that that's, to, yeah, it's an interesting observation because there is a sort of like, you know, like these real angular intervals and stuff that I think are what define it as part of that, that, um, that sort of gothic, capital R romantic 19th century sound but it mm. I think it's more of like an like an aural uh, illusion to feel a kind of you know eastern uh, twist to it I totally hear where you're getting that but I think that's I think that's just different forms of chromaticism kind of all overlapping because it's definitely got that you know that real like you know these these harmonies that are you know you know, just real tight and crunchy. and But there's this one moment yeah. that I love that's unmistakably Thomas Newman where, you know, he, he would do these beautiful dissonances if you listen to, like, Shawshank Redemption. And then he pulls out one at the very end of this cue where you... Like, this almost could be the opening of Shawshank if you listen to it fresh-minded, th- this bit mm. here. That... That is a... Very Thomas Newman move right there, it sort of, to sort of slide through a suspension that way, but the dissonance mm-hmm. actually stays. You know, the... Very Thomas Newman, despite the fact that you know we start, you know, you know, just as as seemingly un Thomas Newman imaginably. But then here, the other piece that I played, Gung Ho. Oh, that's what it is. So, do you know like that a movie? movie? Yeah, dude. So, I never yeah. would have been able to pick it out. That, that's a great. Well, 1986. I think Michael Keaton, 86. What's so funny is that, like, looking at his, 
Reckless. I don't even see Thomas Newman. That on his thing is it goes Reckless to Quicksilver, which was also at 86. Kevin Bacon movie. Uh, where Kevin Bacon rides a bicycle. <laughs> so, but yeah, he goes, it's it's interesting, 84, 86, 90 to 91, 91 fried green tomatoes. What are you looking 93, at? You're skipping oh, a his lot. IMDb. Oh, well, there's a bunch of stuff that you're skipping past. He, he always... This is interesting because I'm looking at him uh, for, maybe it's just the soundtrack that's, Fascinating. Well, I, I, I can't see what's going on. Uh, I didn't realize he was also the uh, composer for the newsroom. And uh, I think he greatness. just. I think he just did the theme. Just did the theme. How often is, does that happen? To where a composer like Snuffy Walden from from West Wing. Uh, yeah, he did both. He did both. And even the theme was like, that, you're not going to use that for the theme, are you? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's totally the theme. He's like, oh, I wasn't intending that for that to be the theme. Right. Uh, <laughs> my favorite cue that he has, by the way, is the one that's used for the end credits, where no matter what happens at the end of the episode, if you've never watched West Wing, it's been out for 20 years. You, you, I'm, I'm the one who's late to the party. It's like, they've captured the president's daughter. And then, bring them, but they can think and think and think and don't worry about your feelings. Everything's okay. <laughs> it always goes network happy. It's so funny. Yeah, they, um, they always do that stuff like, you know, during the sort of pilot production, and then they just literally reuse the same recording over and over. There are some shows that realize this was not going to work. And if you look at a show like Breaking Bad, almost every episode, the end credits music is unique to that episode. And it's coming yeah, from. Honestly, Walking Dead did the same thing as like, let's use a uh, an original song. Um, and let's bring that in, or even better, you could always tell in the end of the episode for, what was it? Uh, what show was it? It wasn't Breaking Bad. It was something else where it was like, this is the end of the episode because it would begin at the very end. Mm. Uh, but This Is Us is fantastic about doing that, and it's like, that's the song that takes you out. It's like, woof, what a great song. Yeah. Um, but how often does that happen to where, I mean, you th why why doesn't the composer who comes up with the theme like in the, in the in the instance of of newsroom, why wouldn't Aaron Sorkin want Thomas Newman to also be the composer? I would think he would want that gig. So, if that show were being greenlit today, probably it would be the case. But that's just long enough ago that it's the tail end of a different era of television, where generally, if you were doing film, doing TV is a step down. But it's a very mm. plum gig to do the main titles in the same way that, you know, um, 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 Frank Darabont swoops in, does the pilot of Walking Dead. And as far as I'm aware, never works on the show again. I, I could be wrong about that. But I mean, kind of kind of not showrunner necessarily, but spiritual. Well, guidance. yeah, definitely not showrunner. I, I didn't think I, I thought that, you know, you you direct the pilot to sell, to kind of like set the levels on the on the console essentially and then you walk away and other people take it from there and you obviously right. get a nice big paycheck for being the director of the pilot if it's a thing that goes into syndication and stuff that's a very plum gig that's why it's very often very prestigious well known people that that are called in for that same exact the comp it's the, the composer corollary to that you know Thomas Newman does the main title to 6 feet under uh some other composer, I think it was Rolf Kent, comes in and does the actual show, and then mm. and then Rolf Kent comes in and does the theme to Dexter, and um, you know, um, 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 crap, I'm blanking on his name. He he died. Flippy McGillicuddy does. He died recently. Of... He was such a lovely guy. Dan Licht uh, comes in and does um, this actual score. You know, so that now, like I said, nowadays TV is where it's at. You know, you've got like Chris Beck. Uh, scoring, you know, WandaVision and just announced as the new composer on the Hawkeye show. And it's like Chris Beck is a massive, massive film composer, but he's going, I'll take the TV gig. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So times have changed. TV is very much a is a hotbed for creativity and and for, you know, you can you can lure people in because it's TV. The thing was always it was a grind, you know, in the older days. But now we're in this prestige. They spend a year making eight episodes like the Queen's Gambit or something. But before it was, okay, we got nine months to make 22 episodes. So it was like, you know, quality is less important to just on time. 
and a guy like Snuffy Walden or or um, 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 crap, what's his name? Like the original Hans Zimmer, uh, you know, the A Team and the ten thousand other uh, big. I don't know who uh, that composer was. It's killing me. Um, it's such an obvious Mike Post yeah Jesus obvious oh, yeah, yeah Mike, Mike Post wrote like a thousand of the most famous TV themes ever and then oversaw kind of a shop of composers that would handle the day to day episode and he was writing I think a lot of it himself but I think at some point he did kind of transition into being more of a managerial role and so uh, he kind of was one of the first to really pilot that what is now sort of the remote control Hans Zimmer like mm -hmm. I am the producer of this entity. Uh, I am the like the chairman of the board, as it were. Um, but so anyway, that all that said, yes, Thomas Newman, uh, it, he can make far more money uh, scoring films. But if he can sweeten the pot with uh, a you know a, a syndicated or otherwise very well trafficked um, TV theme, um, then you know it's just the gig gets that much better. So yeah, that first one, uh, another trivia, by the way, with your Michael Keaton movie, that's a Ron Howard directed movie, which I did not realize. Gung Ho? Gung Ho. Yeah. It's so funny. It's fascinating to think that, you know, Ron Howard's main guy these days is Hans Zimmer, but he did work a few times with James Horner. He did at least one film with John Williams, Far and Away. Um, and, e. but he, um, but he, uh, he's done, he did Parenthood, which was Randy Newman. But it's funny to think that one of his earliest films, Gung Ho, is Thomas Newman. I always wondered how that happened. I don't know the story there. Um, but yes, Thomas Newman has so many scores that you may not know. So I'll play one that you mentioned as you were running down his list. This is one of my favorite cues he has ever written, and I would be lying to deny the influence that this had on me as a composer. Um, uh, and it's, it's not going to be a hidden gem to most people, pr probably including you, but I just have to play it because it made me so happy when uh, Pixar pulled him in uh, and, and made him part of their ecosystem and exposed such a wider audience. Because, like I said, he was known as the guy for, you know, for American Beauty. You know, these are not exactly mainstream blockbuster films. I was looking at soundtrack, not composer. OK, so now uh, that's why. Here we go. So here's oh. this is uh, the scene in Wally -E where Eva and Wally -E are spinning around outside the ship, and the guy is looking up the things, and he goes, "Define dancing." And um, I just remember I always thought, God, what a piece of music this is. This is what that bass is doing. so well produced too yeah dude like you guys really should be listening to this on headphones because the mix of this is incredible there's stuff relationally in space that's happening yeah, that's incredible. really beautiful sense of foreground middle ground background and just even just mid-side just like yep what i love is that the bass is playing something that is very Consider and even even those top strings. Everything's happening in like kind of like the syncopated sixteenth. Yeah, it's like it's like fitting into all the little gaps, you know, dig -a, dig -a, which would be dig -a, like dig -a. very computery, right? Ro very robotic. But then there's this lush thing that's happening around it. Those the unmistakable Thomas Newman chords. Yeah, it's Shawshank. Yeah, he has such a strong voice as a composer. So I had as to play you'd that. Say, the, the, the signature. But yeah. I mean, interesting enough about Wally, -E, that is a movie that I walked into the theater going, he's like, I cannot wait for this movie to come out. I will own this movie. I will watch this movie. Are you kidding me? Pixar movie in space, it's exactly, I would call it a fall asleep movie. It's a movie that you want to put on and just fall asleep to. I saw the movie once and I'll never see it again. Really? I, for, for whatever reason, I was hit with such an overwhelming, and I think the reason why is I remember seeing E.T. 
in in the movie mm. theater. And I walked out of that theater, and I remember these words. Holy crap! This is like forty whatever years later. I remember walking out and going forty That's exactly, my, almost yes, exactly. forty years, eighty one, right? Eighty two. 82? Yeah, so next I walked year. out and was like, that's my brother. That's my brother. <laughs> and I I wanted I wanted the connection that Elliot had with with E.T. And so I have a, I have a real tough time watching E.T. Even to this day as a grown man, I'm going to watch it with my son. I'm really curious to see what he thinks about it. But the movie Wally just I was it was I was overwhelmed with this, this sense of melancholy with with uh with Wally specifically. And it was like, what a sad movie! It's just such a it's such a sad movie um, about us as a, as a species, about the speaking of solipsism and just the the whole isolation that he has as a creature. And the one thing that he wants is to be able to have a connection with this other being that's like him. It's just this poignant piece. That I'm like, I don't know why. <laughs> it's too there's so much. much about it that's so marvelous. I mean, the fact that they go like an hour before there's a single spoken word in that movie, you know, for a for a for like an ostensibly, you know, family film to make a yeah. move that bold. And, you know, plus it's like it's kind of like one of the great, you know, final works. Uh, I mean, he's still around, uh, but but after establishing himself as like the premier sound design, sound artist of all time, Ben, ben Burt, you know, he they're like, we need you to, you know, remember, remember the truly immortalizing perfect creations of like R2D2. We need we need that again, but new somehow. And yeah. so he goes and does Wally and it's like, God damn, this guy is just a fountain of genius. So there's, yeah. There's still so many things about R2 that, that we wanted, right? We wanted we wanted him to be he we needed him to be like R2. In order to just immediately ingratiate ingratiate ourselves to him. Um, it's just so so I, I, I played that bit from Wally because that's sort of that piece I think is probably the one that people would know but there's a piece that I absolutely love because I love that it's so weird and it's just so deliciously bizarre and it's one of those that if you didn't know Thomas Newman's work intimately you would not guess this is him um, but when I listen to it I'm like this is so Thomas Newman because I just I've listened to enough of his stuff that you can hear this is also from Wally Oboes. Those are oboes? Yeah, dude. It's just great. And all he's doing right there is just kind of downsampling. And yet it's just filtering, so... right? But it's it feels exactly what we interpret as computerized robotic. And all these He's also doing stuff that's like I I'm assuming like all the snare stuff that's happening too is like matching what's happening in the picture, but the the crossing lines that you're not supposed to do, it's like, hey, hey, don't put a drum kit in a in an orchestra. Hey, don't don't put an electric bass in an orchestra. Right. Like you're not supposed to do that. I love the notion of not breaking the rules, but rather ignoring them. Yeah, he's definitely always done his own thing. Uh and and like Jerry Goldsmith. Oh, very much so. Um uh in the opposite vein, here's a movie that uh uh people some people really remember this, especially if you were kind of growing up, you know, in the mid nineties, this is uh, one of his, I fairly certain this is one of his earlier Oscar nominated scores. I'll have to double check that, but I always loved this because it's Thomas Newman does Americana. Um, this is uh, little women. For a guy that's so known for all these like jamming guitars and the marimbas and the tablas, just old fashioned traditional orchestra. He's actually not so known so for that. And I- What's weird is that I, 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 for whatever reason, my misconception is this is what I think of when I think of Thomas Newman. 
I don't but think it, about the but, jamming guitars and the marimbas and the. I, I think of the strings that carry me in, in, into a very em, em, emotional place. This is a little bit more, maybe, as you said, Wagnerian. No, this is but, pure. This is so British. Uh, this is, yeah, this is like Handel almost, uh, you know? Not that he was British, but he was associated with British. Just warm, feel good. I always just thought it was just, it's classy, it's lovely writing, you know, it just yeah. really... It doesn't do anything, it doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. I forgot that Christian Bale was in that movie. But it does exactly what you want it to be, yeah. Look at that. Young, well not young Christian Bale. Young Christian Bale would be like Empire of the Sun. I was gonna say, yeah, that's... Newsies, <laughs> that's young and, Christian Bale. And my God, you look at that and you go, that kid's gonna be a movie star. That's, I mean, Steven Spielberg said that in his documentary, it was like, I knew immediately, it was like, that guy and he is it's so it's so impressive man yeah. threesome i saw that thing in the theater what an awkward movie to see in the theater here was my uh, i i just looked it up uh i was right that little women i forgot that little women and shawshank came out the same year thomas newman got his first and second oscar nomination in the same pool of nominees in 1995 little women and shawshank were nominated against each other um hmm. I did not remember that. That's a that's probably why he didn't win for Shawshank because, you know, the you split your ticket in those instances. Um, How often does that happen? It's not common, you know, because it's just it's rare to land two really noteworthy gigs that come out in the same release window. It has though. James Horner was nominated uh, for um, Apollo 13 and Braveheart in the same year. Um, and my favorite example of this is that John Williams won, but was among the nominees that he beat was himself for Close Encounters, uh, for Star like for Star Wars. It's it's funny to think of those coming out the same year. Um, that it's like <laughs> who came up with that? That wasn't John Williams, yeah, was yeah, it? Yep. So he he uh, reportedly he tried something in the neighborhood of like two or three or four hundred five note combinations before deciding on that one. He was really meticulously, like almost mathematically, working through everything he could think of before he landed on that one. I one of my favorite stories uh, from Close Encounters is I want to make sure I get the name right. Um, Spielberg, uh, Bob Balaban. Uh, mm, who's that? He played the in the very beginning. He had the beard. And he he was the one that was kind of like on the, the army camp that was kind of orchestrating everything. He was the scientist. Uh, didn't speak a word of French, but he had this huge scene where he's supposed to speak French. And so he faked it in the audition and they hired him and he was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and that's uh, so funny. He's still I think he still fought randomly. Like but somehow he like got drunk or whatever and decided to follow a bunch of people because he started following me and then Liam O'Brien texted me he's like dude Bob Balaban's following me I was like <laughs> um, I was like somebody got a hold of his Twitter uh, yeah I would love That's to so funny. he's still active yeah I'm looking him up I recognize him as soon as I uh, he's pulled been him up. so much stuff he, I love him in he, he was great in uh, Waiting for Guffman like I I would love to just sit and talk to him about that role alone. Um, my God, we are all over the place. I have one final, which ironically is a TV series that Thomas Newman scored um, because it was a limited limited run miniseries on HBO. And one of the things, Thomas Newman is capable of writing a truly great tune, as evidenced by the good German, you know, that, you know, like what I didn't play for you. Um, or, no, no, sorry, it was in there. The... the where is it here? Uh, the da na na. Yeah. Like, this is an interesting melody. Uh, 
But you know, it's so it's so very much of that expressionist German vocabulary that it it would be hard to label it as you know the most deeply memorable uh, melody of all time. Uh, I would argue, um, and Thomas Newman in general, I would say his strength. Ha- or what, I, I, actually, I shouldn't even say that far. I would say what has um, really made his reputation so so uh, you know solidified is that he has written so many of these textural atmospheric memorable for their kind of uniqueness scores um, of which American beauty I think uh, sits at the top of mm. the of the pile um, the most sort of notable example of that um, the the you know I wasn't gonna play it but I'm I'm grabbing it here to just play it for a split second to contrast the final one that I'm going to share. Um, you know, that Thomas Newman thing that he does, you know, the... So there's your marimbas. Yeah, this is by far his most iconic score, I would say, even more than Shawshank, because this has ended up in every temp score of every reality show and every drama, every indie dramedy. Every composer who has worked in the last 20 years has been told, we want it to sound like this, but don't get us sued. You know, this, like, all the weird sounds and, the again, it's like a band jamming. There's no real melody melody. Not in the traditional melodic sense. It's like a hook, that dum ba dum ba dum And same thing, since we mentioned it at the beginning, pay it forward. It's very similar. Here's pay it forward. Hmm. I love so this I score. Hear, I hear vibes happening in the background. What's what's in the front there? It's like a gamelan or something, like from from ba- from like like Balinese or Java Java Javanese gamelan. I mean, it's fucking great, right? Like, it, yeah, it's just, dude, that's a and, jam. And there's nobody. He kind of invented a new <laughs> language of film scoring. Like, it, it, it's nobody was doing things that sounded like that. He was so. I always marveled at the fact that his father, you know, who wrote some of the most iconic classical melodies, like "Love Is Many a Splendored Thing," and it just so. It, like I said, his father won. I said, I think I said five earlier. He won nine Oscars. Uh, Tom, uh, 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 said Alfred nine. Newman. Did I say nine? He was nominated 45 times. He won nine. Although there's an asterisk one could put on that, but I don't want to go on a tangent. So the the fact that Thomas Newman would be so different in his musical personality from his father and sort of equally, if not more brilliant to me is incredible. Because if you're the son, I always felt bad for Joel Goldsmith, for example, Jerry's son. Like, you're just doomed to live in his shadow. You know, how do you outdo... Jerry Goldsmith. Well, if if it would be really righteous to ask Thomas Newman, how do you outdo Alfred Newman? And honestly, he has. You know, he may not have the Oscars to show for it, but he has made such an impact on this art form. And I, I say all that as a way to say that that sound, the pay it forward thing I was just playing, the um, uh, 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 um, 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 the fuck American is Beauty, the American Beauty that I was playing, those represent kind of, I think the top most like when we were describing that that pyramid of you know the thing that's really famous then the sort of mid level like there's a few more of these that are pretty well known and then down below are the gems that nobody knows about you know that top level american beauty kind of sound that he does a lot and you can even hear it in these other like wally even though those are bigger or more orchestral uh what a lot of those have in common is not the world's what i would call strongest traditional Melodies. Now the the Little Women, you know, ta, na, ta, na, na, that's fine. It's not it's not a bad melody, but it's not genius. But the funny is, thing, go ahead. Well, I'll no, just no, say no, is the funny, he, he, the funny thing is that he really is. What I love is that he. It seemingly that's a tool that he uses, if and only if it's necessary for a given project. You know, unlike John Williams, who seemingly can't help himself but just writing these very iconic melodies, and of course, he tends to score films where that's really what they need and what they warrant. Um, 
Thomas Newman has done so many where a more abstract, more atmospheric, lighter touch is what's right, and he doesn't impose melody on it. But when the chance comes along to really write a killer tune, there have been occasions where he has done that. And so for me, this last one that I was going to play um, is my single favorite piece he's ever written because God. it's all the things I love about him. It's interesting colors. You'll hear this one moment where there's these wonderful little flutes racing around up high where you're like, where did that come from? But at its heart, it's just a painfully beautiful oboe melody. You ready? Hell of a setup. Play it. trumpets and the flutes and it has all the things that he does it's great writing for the orchestra beautiful melody all these colors interesting instruments coming and going it's just perfect man the ability to write for horns to go full blast but not overpower that's incredible because normally when you have those big bombastic horns, they're front and center, and those were way back here. The whole thing is extremely wet. The orchestra sounds like they're being tracked down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's just so... <laughs> what it's was that so, for? That's the HBO miniseries Angels in America. Oh, and shit. To me, to me, when that came out, I, I was in college when that came out, and when I heard that, I was like, he just jumped to another level. I couldn't. I remember I had a little, whatever a precursor to the iPod would be, like some really, really janky off-brand MP3. MP3 player, and I put this on there, and I would wander the streets of Manhattan just listening to it over and over and over because I just thought, this is, this is, if I could achieve a tenth of this as a composer, I will feel like I've made my I've made my mark because it just the way it made me feel was so overwhelmed and emotional and it's just and I just I love that it's so unmistakably him and yet mm. it doesn't feel like he's rehashing anything that he's done and that to me that's such a magical sweet spot to hit there is you know obviously as a composer you as a professional person it is something that you hope to you, and, and really you've defied the odds to be able to craft this as your career, be able to monetize it in a way that allows you to perpetuate this as your profession. And then you go above and beyond that and you're actually, you receive awards and accolades, both not only from you know, distinguished institutions, but also by your peers, which is probably the, well, definitely is the more, um, the more valued. But the thing that you hit on just there, I have so many memories of putting on an album or a score and throwing in headphones and just walking. Like you said, wandering around Manhattan. I've done it in New York. I've done it in Los Angeles. I've done it in Tokyo. I've done it in London. I've done it in Paris. I've done it around the world. I have these incredible memories. 
And of all of the accolades, obviously you want Thomas Newman is like, man, I really need to get that Oscar. I really want to be able to <laughs> get something that allows, because at the, at the end of the day, as David Milt said, the exigencies of the artist situation are always of the financial. The most immediate need is always of the financial. So being able to create something that will allow you to get the next job and then maybe be able to get you not only just the accolade, but also something that will allow you to be able to choose the, the projects that you want to do. But I can't help but think for someone like Thomas Newman, who has now been working since 1984 was the first thing that I saw. So good God, he's going on 40 years of being able to do this. Mm -hmm. To be able to know that there was some composer that while he was in school and learning and, and forming his own voice, was throwing in headphones and listening to something that very, very possibly was a gig for him to be able to keep the roof over his own head. <laughs> and and that inspired you and, and to the point to be able, not only that, but also now 15 years later, to sit here with a friend and go, this to me is a perfect example of music. And is, it is a signature selection from his comp, uh, you know, compendium of, of, of music that he's written. That to me is the most valued of accolades. I, I, well, I hope he listens to this and, and uh, takes that to heart. I, I, I A.T. Noom? I, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You know, to me, I remember a few years ago, uh, my, my nonprofit, ETMLA, was honoring John Williams at our annual gala, and they asked me to, to uh, be in charge of um, making the video presentation that we were going to show. And the question is, you know, how do you even, how do you even um, frame um, John Williams? Like, what do you say that hasn't been said? You know, what, if you want to make a video presentation to say, here's why we're honoring him, it's almost boring at its premise. So what do you do? And so my pit, my initial pitch, which we, we didn't go with this. We, instead I interviewed, I went and shot a bunch of interviews with um, his top ranking studio musicians. And I, I said, tell me what it's like to bring his music to life fr at, from the site read onward. And I got all of his, you know, first call musicians to tell war stories of, of working with him directly, which was just such an amazing experience. But, um, but the original pitch that I had was, I said, if you go on YouTube, there's thousands and thousands of young kids who are like practicing French horn because they want to play the binary sunsets from Star Wars or or via or, or, you know, cello trying to play, you know, Yoda's theme or what. And I said, he, he his music. It's not just that. Let me phrase it this way. It would be enough to write something that millions and in fact, billions in his case uh, of people love and they listen to it and it brings them peace or it brings them excitement. They, they listen to it as, you know, they, they go down the aisle at their wedding or they play it at a, at a parent's funeral or they, it helps them get through, you know, they got laid off. And so they listen to this music and it just helped them get process the moment or whatever, you know, those, there's those emails, those notes, they, they exist. That, that would be enough. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing to get that kind of feedback from someone, but to know that you've gone one step more and you've actually inspired them to differently use their time in this life than they might have otherwise. I picked up the cello because I heard that score. I'm sure there are oboists in the world that first heard the oboe in angels in America and just sat there and said, I got to get me one of those. And that to me is that is the greatest accolade knowing that somebody they've reconfigured their time in this world around something as a side effect it's not even oh i love this music it's like this music motivated me to do something that i wasn't otherwise going to do and it's by the end what that what's so beautiful about that in the spirit of our favorite example of the the cathedral builders who are who are somewhere in the middle of the process they are they are working on the bricks laid down by someone they never met and they are laying a foundation for future people they will never meet what i love is that it's not even about the music or about the composer anymore some seed has been planted with this other person to go learn the elbow or whatever and now they're going to go off and their whole life is potentially going to be very different because of that it may have started with angels in america but we don't even know where it's going to go that to me that that spider web outward ripple that's what I love is that you'll never know w the result. You'll never know the outcome unless someone tracks you down to say, here's how my life you know, went because of your work or whatever. But generally speaking, you'll never know. You just know that 
you just hope that what you put out there actually does that and god knows his music has that's the button <laughs>